Good afternoon and welcome to the last day of EEP Africa's Knowledge Week. My name is Faith Chege, I'm a portfolio manager and also leading our clean cooking and our e-mobility work at EEP. I'm based in Nairobi, Kenya, and it is my pleasure to be your host and your moderator for today's session on strengthening the ecosystem for clean cooking solutions. Some housekeeping instructions before we get started. There are on your right side, on the right side of your screen, there's a little box where you can post all your questions and we will answer that at the end of uh, the presentations. Hoping this is a really interactive session, so keep the questions coming. And this session will also be recorded and we will share this with you afterwards. A uh, quick look at our agenda for the session. We'll start off with introductions and I will give some opening remarks on our work at EEP on clean cooking. Then I will quickly introduce the speakers and then allow them to uh, all go through their presentations on the amazing work they're doing. Then we will have a session for questions and answers. So just starting off with the work that we're doing at EEP in clean cooking. EEP Africa plays a key role in this ecosystem as we provide grant funding that is used mainly by the early stage companies to pilot innovative solutions and business models. And, so, and then we go ahead to support these companies to reach proof of concept. We have also focused on nascent markets such as Burundi to ensure that our funding can go into catalyzing uh, those markets for future investments and to support early stage companies as they begin to do work there. Over the last four years, we have invested in a diverse portfolio of 15 cooking companies with uh, various technologies and various applications. They are producing briquettes and pellets from bagas, rice husks, fico sludge, and other agricultural waste. They're also manufacturing and distributing various cookstove types, gasifiers, electric, ethanol at both household and industrial levels. And we have also backed two biogas companies that are using innovative business models to deliver energy to their customers. And we do this work across 15 countries on the continent. And as early stage investors, we know that it takes a lot of partnerships and various interventions at various stages of growth to get these companies to scale and to be able to get this nascent markets to an investable stage. The clean cooking ecosystem is also actively exploring innovative financing mechanisms to increase the level and types of capital available to close the vast financing gap. This being RBFs and carbon financing, mainly representing the forefront of the funding innovation and a largely untapped source of catalytic capital for clean cooking. To unlock this funding, however, strong unit economics are required, data on new solutions, as well as blended financing to be able to support companies through the various stages of growth. And on our panel today and in our session today, we look at this various uh, innovative interventions and also explore the opportunities and also be able to demystify some of the new trends in the market. So joining us on our panel today are five experts. Thank you for making the time to join us and share the amazing work that you're doing to strengthen the various nodes of the ecosystem. Our first panelist will be Ronan Ferguson, who is a senior manager of private sector and investment at the Clean Cooking Alliance. Then after that, we'll hear from Lillian Kagume, who's the head of climate asset management at the Climate Impact Partners. And thereafter, we'll hear from Kari Hamekoski, who is a senior program manager at NEPCO and the Modern Cooking Facility for Africa, followed by Amarins Hakema, who is the Chief Data Officer at ACE, Africa Clean Energy, and also a portfolio of EEP Africa. And then last but not least, from Kalin Groen, who is a Project Advisor of Energy at SNB Kenya. Welcome uh, our speakers for the day. I will now invite Ronan to kick off the presentation and to give us an overview of the trends in the sector, the unit economics, and how he sees uh, both debt financing, equity financing, carbon financing growing from Clean Cooking Alliance's perspective. Welcome, Ronan. Great. Thanks so much, Faith, and thanks for the introduction. Hello, everyone. And we're going to move to the first slide just to say which topics I'm looking to, to cover today. Uh, Ten minutes cover four things. It's ambitious, but we'll, we'll we'll give it a go. Uh, we'll spend a lot of time talking about carbon, 
uh, and the revenue trends that we're seeing in, in clean cooking at the moment. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about uh, that supply side, so c companies that are um, looking to access uh, carbon revenues. Um, the importance of debt, actually, in just traditional debt, uh, so, so not too innovative, but uh, is, is uh, increasingly important at the moment. So we'll talk a little bit about, um, about debt and, and we'll highlight Spark Plus Africa Fund as uh, one new source of, uh, of debt uh, and, and mezzanine capital. Uh, and then we'll finish with, uh, uh, I suppose, a bridge into the next presentation, which is what, what the carbon buyers really look for in, in, in their carbon credits from, from clean cooking. So if we could jump to the first slide. Great, and starting with carbon then, the, the latest data for 2021 show revenues from carbon credit sales made by clean cooking companies, which is that light blue wedge in, in the chart, rose from 11 million in 2020 to 11 and a half million in 2021. That's almost a quarter of the total revenues seen in that year, which is the latest year that we, we currently have data for. Um, actually, that, that's something of a reduction uh, compared to the levels that they were at in 2020, where it was around 30% of, of overall revenues being attributed to carbon, but significant, right? And uh, 2021 relative to uh, the leftmost part of the, the chart there, 2017, is, is a 22-fold increase in carbon revenues um, that are being uh, reported to us by clean cooking companies. Um, we expect that trend to, to continue. Um, and this could, I think, be an encouraging sign, right? Um, carbon revenues are essentially subsidizing the price of clean cooking solutions. Uh, and this might be causing, you know, kind of a price elastic response, causing increased demand for products, uh, which in turn catalyzes more revenues from clean cooking sales. And you know, if you just keeping with that um, chart on the on the left there, the, the darker blue, you know, there's an uptick there between 2020 and 2021, actually, you know, grew by a third uh, in that time period, um, which carbon could be um, catalyzing. Uh, in terms of uh, that's the what so, so what? Um, well, carbon revenues could prove to be a really great way for businesses to solve for that central issue around customer affordability and willingness to pay, uh, bridging the gap between what customers are willing to pay uh, in, a, in a given market and the fully loaded unit costs of, of, of what an item costs. And that's what I'm trying to just show in that little cartoon uh, blue set of bars on the right, you know, calling out that typically the clean or cleaner solutions um, so by that, I mean tier three for particulate matter, 2.5 carbon monoxide thermal efficiency, safety and durability. The, the, the price point of these solutions typically are, are, are above, sometimes significantly above what price point customers are, are willing to buy that product um, for. And, it, and that's a bit acutely so for people living in poverty. Um, so carbon revenues provide a way um, for companies to subsidize down uh, that, that price point. There, and as we'll see in the next presentation, there are many other ways uh, and applications that carbon revenues can be applied. That's perhaps uh, the most obvious. Um, in, in helping with solving for affordability issues, carbon revenues you know, could accelerate uh, the adoption then of, of cleaner and, and more efficient cooking solutions, which is exciting and, and certainly what we at CCA are, are looking to happen. If we jump to the next slide, Thank you. Um, you know, given that carbon can play a key role in solving for customer affordability issues and accelerating adoption, um, basically every clean cooking company wants in on carbon revenues. Um, this is currently the preserve of those that um, I think A, have proven scale uh, and B, have, have strong access to working capital. So let's look at those uh, in turn. By proven scale, I think there are, there are two approximate, so definitely not scientific, approximate thresholds that, that I kind of look out for. Um, the first is um, a manufacturer that produces around 8,000 stoves, um, which is typically a kind of the, at the project level, that's the boundary at which um, a company is probably going to be big enough to be of interest to a carbon project developer to partner with, because, you know, if, if it's if it's below that, then you know, the volumes of credits that, that get issued don't really make sense for the um, the transaction costs in setting up the, the, the program of, of activities. Um, so that's the first um, kind of threshold that companies are always looking to get beyond. And the second one that 
uh, companies looking to get beyond is the kind of uh, the scale side of 100,000 stoves per year. That that seems to be a point at which companies are big enough to bypass carbon project developers and go straight to end buyers and sell credits directly to them. And um, there's an incentive to do that because that disintermediates that particular market, and that means that you can um, uh, derive a better margin from the from the credits that you're you're generating. Um, so a, a race a race for big scale. Um, the second um, piece was around working capital, and I'm you know, referring to the need for, for companies to cover the cost of creating the inventory um, that gets distributed under the carbon program um, up to the point where, where, where credits are sold. So it, it can take several years for uh, a POA to be approved and for the first uh, associated revenues um, to, to roll in from, from, from ERPAs. Not many companies uh, to date ha have the balance sheets to absorb these long uh, and deep cash flow um, cycle constraints. If we can move to the next slide. Um, yeah, was, well, well, given the importance of debt as a means of working capital, uh, and given the raise uh, in interest in establishing carbon programs, it's perhaps not surprising that in 2021, again, for the latest day that we have, uh, that the debt became the most common type of capital raised by clean cooking companies. Uh, and that's the first time on record um, that that has been the case. Kind of interesting, uh, of the 23 and a half million raised in 2021, just five companies raised more than 90% of that total sum. Again, that's another kind of indicator of what I've been saying, that um, another reason that accessing carbon revenues currently is the preserve of, of the bigger players in, in the sector. Okay, if we could jump to the next slide. Let's take a look at one of these, uh, the new providers of debt financing in the clean cooking sector, the Spark Plus Africa Fund, managed by uh, Enabling Capital. Um, Faith, I don't know if you did this on purpose, but it is uh, the first birthday of, of Spark Plus. This is uh, the one year anniversary of it uh, being formally launched, uh, a $40 million facility, uh, a mandate to invest both debt and uh, mezzanine capital in companies operating throughout the value chains of various clean cooking fuels, including LPG. Um, and in its first year, it's made three investments. One of them, is, uh, the first one was, it was in burn manufacturing. That was a, uh, the biggest uh, investment it's made, four million uh, long-term crazy equity investment uh, was made in May uh, of last year. Uh, they followed that up with a second investment uh, of um, a $2 million loan um, with, with a, a three-year tenor to Sumac Microfinance Bank um, uh, in September of last year. And basically that loan is, is being used to help customers finance the purchase of uh, either improved cook stoves or biogas digesters um, specifically um, created by Burn Manufacturing or Systema Bio respectively. And then the third investment was a um, more recently January, uh, two and a half year, half million dollar loan to Bida Sasa who were a, a last month distributor, also based in Kenya. Uh, if you could move along to the next one, thank you. Um, yeah, well, well, due to increased uh, importance of carbon financing uh, in, in clean cooking uh, in, in recent years, it's becoming more relevant for, for debt funds like Spark Plus to, uh, Spark Plus to offer uh, securitized offerings on the back of carbon revenues. And, and this is a pivot towards basically more project-based financing. Um, I think that's a trend to look out for in terms of it becoming uh, increasingly important in our sector as, as, as interest and uh, activities in uh, carbon credit projects intensifies. All right, should we flip to uh, carbon buyers and, and what they want? We talked a lot about uh, the supply side, but you know, for there to be a market, uh, there needs to be buyers, uh, large corporates uh, that are looking to offset their, their net zero commitments. It's not an exhaustive uh, set by any means, but some of the key attributes that buyers need from their offsets are integrity. So, you know, the offsets that are being um, created are actually happening, they're, they're not being double counted. Um, uh, and also, uh, particular to clean cooking, uh, this, this kind of charismatic carbon, the co-benefits that come with, with carbon projects from clean cooking. Um, so, you know, whilst you're doing your offsets, you're also getting positive externalities that, uh, that are created around um, reduced environmental degradation, improvements for, for time savings for women, for, for instance. And that tends to um, result in a, a premium price for, for um, carbon from clean cook stoves. 
Um, but returning that, that first point, that need for integrity, um, that's important for everyone. Uh, if the market loses faith in the accuracy of these credits, demand will drop, prices will fall, and then many clean companies could end up in a situation where you know those unit economics just don't pencil out. Um, so what? Uh, well, CCA is, is committed to, to strengthening carbon markets for clean cooking, um, which includes, amongst many things, refining approaches to strengthening integrity and transparency and accountability. Uh, and um, one of the initiatives uh, that's ongoing or just, just being launched at the moment is the Responsible Carbon Finance for Clean Cooking Working Group. Um, that's accepting expressions of interest uh, for, from people that want to join. Uh, you can join up to two of the four subgroups which are listed on the on the screen there, uh, those, those thematic areas. Uh, I think it's going to close by the end of the month, so if you, if you would like to to sign up, you, you can. Uh, I'll make sure that uh, I share with Faith the, uh, the link for, for, for doing that. Thank you for your attention. Faith, I'll, I'll hand back to you, please. Thank you, Ronan, and congratulations on the first year anniversary of the SPAC Fund. I wasn't aware of it, but glad I'm spot on on that one. <laughs> and uh, a really great segue to uh, Lilian Kagume with as we learned, uh, the largest companies are the ones who are benefiting the most from carbon revenues at the moment. And of course, a lot is required on the end of verification, registration, preparing yourself, raising funding. We'd just like to demystify this whole voluntary carbon markets, especially for clean cooking, and especially for our earlier stage companies, which pilot and as scale and as they gear themselves up for. Um, for the carbon uh, markets. Just uh, could you take us through your work at uh, Climate Impact Partners and uh, just help us demystify this topic? Over to you, Lillian. Yeah, thank you, Faith. Thank you, Roland, for setting a very good overview of the carbon financing landscape. So I'll take you through a presentation to understand what is this carbon financing that we are talking through. Uh, talking about what is the development process that is required from, you know, to go through the inception stage up to the time you're able to actually uh, get these carbon credits and basically what are some of the key issues that we are seeing and how maybe project developers can get aligned to this. So maybe to the next slide. So for startup, it's good to understand that uh, Ronan has mentioned that carbon financing basically allows companies to compensate for their emissions by providing sustainable financing for projects that are looking at reducing or uh, absorbing carbon emissions from the atmosphere. And then if you look at uh, from a project developer's perspective, what is the role of this carbon? bond financing, why is it needed? So basically this goes into enhancing affordability and accessibility of the project technologies. So in, from a cooking, uh, clean cooking perspective, this mostly goes, if you look at uh, the big players in the market, uh, especially those with the very advanced technologies, we have the improved biomass uh, electric cooking, if you look at the cost of the stoves, uh, actually they are not very affordable for maybe a, a, mid, a middle, uh, yeah, the middle income earners. So there is need for actually uh, an intervention to subsidize the cost of the technologies and also support the after sale services. Uh, also for generally supporting the overall operation and implementation of the program. You understand that uh, when you talk of carbon, it's very interesting because it's actually all about data. So without data, you cannot actually uh, have a successful carbon program. So a lot of effort is needed to put uh, the systems in place for quality data collection, ensuring you're able to do very good monitoring for these projects, provide training and uh, awareness creation to the end users. Again, because you want, you don't want to dispatch units that will just end up being stacked somewhere in the corner of the house. So there is also need for that. And then also research and development because there is a lot of evolutions, a lot of technologies coming in the market. 
you want to ensure that you have the most efficient product that you can have in the market and also basically cope up with all these advancements in technology that are coming up because you know if you just have a very old model uh, of some of these technologies with the time they get phased out as end users of course search for more uh, customer friendly products and then overall especially for the nature-based solutions they have an aspect of community development so you'll find that you know they want to give back to the community so part of this carbon financing goes into that when you talk of projects that can actually qualify for carbon financing so apart from the cook stoves which are very popular uh, which can basically be most of them are household based we have other technologies that uh, installed or serve a wider community or institutions. So these can be safe water supply projects, efficient solar lighting technologies, the biogas programs. We also have the nature-based solutions, renewable energy projects, waste management, sustainable buildings such as concrete uh, uh, blocks. Uh, and then we have efficient uh, and innovative industrial processing. So like things like cogeneration, uh, improved uh, cement blends, and also methane capture, and also transportation. Uh, you can, I think, especially when here locally, you have seen a lot of advance, advancements towards immobility. So these all fall under part of projects that can actually qualify for carbon financing. So next slide. Next slide, please. So when we talk about, so when you look at now these projects, of course, uh, how you, they have to, of course, be developed within a standard. I'll talk about the carbon standards that are there. And the overall process, uh, this is uh, from, the time you do the project design stage up to the time you have an, uh, an issuance. So I'll focus on the gold standard uh, certification process, although it tends to be generic for across the standards. So the first step, of course, is to do the plan for project, uh, plan the project and hold a stakeholder consultation uh, process. So this is basically where you bring together the stakeholder has informed them about your project and then take them through what you are seeking to do, capture their comments. And normally this process takes about four to five months, factoring in the notice periods that you have to give. And the cost involved for actually uh, doing that preliminary review process with the gold standard, you have to pay uh, $9,900. And then once you do this, it goes through review by SustainCert. So SustainCert is an interface uh, for the gold standard, which basically reviews the project. So once they review the project, then they will give a positive uh, feedback whether it can proceed to listing. Uh, listing basically means that a project now can be viewed on the registry and you can see the documents and the overall design for the project. And then uh, the other step is to do the validation. So the validation of the project is done by a third party, what we call a validation and verification body. This is a process where they basically review uh, the design of the project against the, the, the set baseline. So you have to do a baseline and confirm that you know, uh, according to the methodology that is being applied, that project fits within that uh, methodology. And then they'll do a site visit in most cases to see the project and confirm the baseline and then prepare what we call a validation report. So once you get the validation report, it's basically uh, VVB giving an opinion that it can either be negative or positive for them confirming that the project can proceed for design certification by the standard. 
So when the project goes for the design review by this, the standard, uh, this is where basically you provide what we call the project design document with the validation report outlining uh, the design of the project and how the project is being aligned to the intended uh, monitoring plan. And then this review again takes uh, around seven months from the time you do, you start the validation up to the time you're able to get the registration. And again, there is a fee associated with this, uh, which is normally counted at 0 0.15 per credit. This is based on the first year of issuance. So during the validation, we do what we call the ex ante uh, emission estimations for each project. And this forms the basis for the fee that is payable to the standard. But once now a project has achieved a positive registration, it can proceed now to the monitoring phase. So this is the step five, where now the project developer actually goes to, to the field to collect the data. So the data I talked about in the beginning. So you will have to revisit your end users, confirm they are using your technologies, assess the usage rates, uh, check against the other co-benefits, because apart from just the emission reductions, as Ronan mentioned, Projects are also supposed to contribute to other core benefits. So for like a cook stove uh, project, you'll be required to maybe check how you are contributing towards improved health issues around indoor air pollution. Uh, you'll be required to monitor maybe employment. How, how is it contributing po positively towards employment creation? So all this now, you collect the data, then you do the emission reduction calculations and prepare a monitoring report, which then goes back to that party again, the VVB, for a process we call verification. So for verification, again, the VVB will cross-check against the monitoring plan that you set up at the validation stage to confirm that the project has actually been monitored against that plan. And then once they are happy, they'll do a site visit again so to confirm with the end users that the data that was collected is actually correct. And then they'll do a verification report, which again goes to the standard for the last stage, what we call the performance review. So again, there is fees associated around this for the standard. And this is usually a thousand uh, USD. So if you look at the overall process from the start to the end, it can take you about 12 to 18 months to get a project uh, registered and actually issued because the main challenge uh, across the certification process is data availability. So this is one actually of the main challenges that are faced in the cook, uh, clean cooking sector because if you are not able to trace uh, the end users, depending on the distribution model that you are using, it is very likely that you'll not get this data. And this is data that you'll need across the lifespan of the project. And then when you look at the issue of the cost, I think this is, again, is one of the barriers that is limiting the not very big boys in the industry because the fees associated from just to do the, the development, it can range anywhere between 30,000 to 50,000 USD. So these factors in the payments you have to pay to the standards, the consultants, and also the monitoring and uh, evaluation costs associated with that. So it actually becomes a barrier because if you don't have a project partner who is offering this pre-financing of, you know, to offset this cost, it actually becomes very restrictive. And as climate impact partners, that is one of the areas where we come in to basically support uh, project developers to overcome this barrier. So we are project developers. In some cases, we do offer pre-financing so that we are able to cater for this cost associated with the development and basically also manage the process so that it is done in accordance with the standard requirements and also what the methodologies require. So that till the end now you are able to finally access these carbon credits. So next slide.
So this is the detailed process of what is required at each stage. I think I've overall talked about it. Uh, but the main thing to, again, to note is for you to be able to develop this. I think for those who may be interested into going into project development, uh, you must have a, a registry account with whatever standard you are working, uh, you intend to seek. So this again is an extra cost and it requires, of course, you have the requisite documents to put through because that is the inf interface through which you'll be able to share these documents and manage control uh, of the whole process. And also it's to this account that the issuance that is actually, will actually be made. So I think, sorry, Mag, I think we skipped one slide that have the carbon standard, which is very critical. I think if you can go back to that, yeah. So first, I think, sorry for that, if we can just be able to understand when we talk of these standards, so we have several internationally recognized uh, and ratified standards, and this provides the overall framework for registration and issuance of carbon credits. So for these organizations, they are actually accredited by the International Carbon Reductions and Offset Alliance, what we call ICROA. And for them to be verified or to be certified to do this process, first they must demonstrate that the emissions are real. So the project developer, you have to demonstrate that your emissions are real. So like for cookstoves, you have to prove that. That's what I, why I mentioned the issue of data that, you know, the end users are actually using these cookstoves because it's the end user who is the right phone of the carbon credits. So if you cannot prove that these are being used, then uh, the emission reductions are not real. And this builds on the issue of integrity that Ronan was talking about, because you don't want to be associated uh, with a project that you cannot demonstrate actually that it's taking place. And this has actually happened in some of the projects. And when we talk of a carbon credit, one carbon credit is equivalent to one ton of CO2 that is being avoided or removed. So when we do the emission reduction calculations, it's basically estimating, uh, if you're using a cook stove, for example, how much carbon are you reducing compared to if you are using the baseline technology that you are using. So it could be a three stone uh, firewood stove or a charcoal stove. So this is what is equated to a carbon credit. So when we do the overall uh, estimation for the project, that is when we can confidently say that, you know, for example, if it's burn project, for example, they have re reduced X ton of emissions, and so they are qualified to access X number of carbon credits, which are then now put in the market for these buyers to, to buy. And then they should be verified. Uh, so this means they have to be audited and verified by a third party. I think I've mentioned about the VVBs. So under the voluntary market, we call them VVBs, and then the certified uh, in the compliance market, they are normally referred as the DOE, the designate, yeah, the DOEs. So they have to be verified. They have to go through that rigorous verification process. And then there must be some level of permanence. So once the emissions are, have been reduced or avoided, you must show that they'll be permanent. So the issue of reversibility, but for nature-based solutions, uh, forestry, this aspect is handled differently. But for energy, like cook stoves, we actually have to demonstrate that these are permanent. Issue of additionality. So the project must be able to demonstrate that, you know, without carbon financing, it would actually not be able to be sustainable. So you have to keep to demonstrate this at the registration stage. So you assess the, this is guided by the methodology, but if the project is proven not to be additional, then it, it basically wouldn't qualify for carbon financing. So depending on this, there are various standards that you can use. So we have the UNF C, we have the gold standard, we have VERA. So for the first three, I think UNFCC is the oldest in the carbon financing sector. But then under the voluntary market, gold standard and VERA rank very highly. And then we have others that have come up 
have come with time. We have GCC, we have the UK Woodland Carbon, we have American uh, Carbon Registry, Climate Action Reserve, Plan Vivo, Emission Reduction Fund for the Australian Government and ART. So when you look at these standards, basically some are very specific for specific projects, like could be forestry. I think for cookstoves from experience, most of them end up being under the gold standard or VERA, uh, under the voluntary market. And so basically when you have different projects, uh, you basically determine which standard to take them through based on the nature of the project and also the methodologies that are available. So I think we can go back to the other slide. You can skip to the third one. Yeah. So for preliminary review, I've mentioned this is the second step, which leads to the listing of the project. Something to touch here is that at this stage, it is very critical to have the project design right. And then there are some mandatory documents that must be signed. Uh, this serves as the registry document. So you have to confirm who are the project project partners. At times uh, for gold standard, you have to confirm who is the CME. So the CME, we call them the coordinated managing entity. This is the right for now of the carbon credits. So at this stage, you need to have a very well established framework because once you send this cover letter, it basically uh, sets the overview of who will own these carbon credits. And then uh, once now the project is listed, you proceed to the next stage of validation. Next. So at validation, I've I mentioned about involving the third party who does the, uh, the validation basically of the project design. And critical thing here again, uh, to consider as a project developer is how you set the baseline. Uh, because one of the main challenges that we have come across is getting the baseline data. Actually, if you go through most of the projects going through different standards, you'll find that you know the baselines are not aligned. Like you can do a baseline in Kenya, get a, maybe an FNRB of 90. Another project developer will do it and get 95. So there's a lot of inconsistency in when you're doing the baseline and the validation. So it's very good to just get your data right and the facts right, uh, because you find that for the factors, the parameters that you actually set as what we call the fixed parameters, they are determined at this stage. So it can have a negative or positive implication of your project, depending on how you set your baseline. So it's very critical to just invest a lot of time and effort in this to get the right baseline for the project. Next. So preliminary uh, project design review by the Sustainsat is basically a confirmation of the validation report by the VVB. And so once uh, at this stage, the standard will not just look at you know the baseline, They'll also look at the safeguards, so what we call the do no, do no harm of the project. So this is part of the integrity we are talking about because the standards do not allow registration of projects that are doing more harm to the environment or to the communities in which they are being implemented. Uh, so it, you have to do a, a very detailed safeguarding assessments and it may actually require you to consult experts on specific issues around gender. If you are dealing with waste, you may require uh, a waste expert or an energy expert to just give their opinion on that. Then they have to confirm the monitoring plan. So what are you committing to monitor? They are the standards uh, or the mandatory things you have to monitor. But then this is where again you set uh, the core benefits that you want to monitor like you can do black carbon for uh, clean cook stoves and so forth. And then once the process is complete, that's when now you end up with a design certified uh, project status, basically meaning the project has been registered. 
So all registered projects, actually, you can be able to access them from the registry. And the project now can proceed for monitoring and uh, what you call the performance review. So next one. So I've talked about monitoring. The only precaution here around monitoring is it's good to understand that when you commit to monitoring a project, there are timelines that are set on when you should do that. So from the time a project is registered, I think it is within two years, you must have done the first monitoring. And then after that, uh, the monitoring for clean cook stove projects is actually annual. And if you fail to conduct any monitoring, if there is a gap between the monitoring periods, you have to do what you call an annual report basically demonstrating that the project is being implemented. This is the current update of the project, because if you do that, then if you skip a monitoring period, you are likely not to be eligible for claiming emission reductions from that period. And then you have, of course, to it also gives you a, an opportunity to continuously interact with your stakeholders. So there must all projects are required to set up a grievance mechanism. So to capture all the issues that you know the end users are raising against your project or technology, and you monitor that and demonstrate how these issues are being addressed. And then, of course, you do the monitoring uh, report. There are standard templates that are used for this. And now submit this for verification by the third party, and then request for the issuance uh, from the standard. Next. So on the third party verification, uh, this again is a very rigorous process, especially if you are doing the first uh, verification. But then there's usually an opportunity to do joint validation and verification for projects, but it depends on how far you are. For example, if you have already started the project, then you already have the monitoring data. At validation stage, you can actually do what you call joint validation and verification. But if you don't do that, then you must do the first verification within two years from the start of the project. And this is usually done, either, it can be desk based, uh, desk review based or an actual visit is required. Challenge you find on the verification process is that, you know, for most of the third party verifiers, especially if you are based in Africa, there are very few very few actually. I think in Kenya we only have one. So this means you have to subcontract uh, these VVBs from outside the country, most of them being Indian based. So the cost associated with the third party review are actually on the higher side. And given that this is a mandatory exercise that you have to do every year, then that adds up to the barriers that you are talking about. But then when you do now the verification is basically done for registered project, you contract the VVB, you submit the monitoring report and all the supporting evidences uh, that are required for this. And then the VVB will conduct the site visit and provide a verification report. So the issue of verification has also brought in, I think, the issue of data privacy, uh, talking of data, because, you know, the standard requires you to publish or to provide the end user database. You have to provide these supporting documents, some of which are very confidential, like employment records. So with time again, you have to evolve with these changes and respect, of course, the data laws that are coming into place. And so these are some of the areas where, you know, stakeholders in the clean cooking sector basically can, you know, come up with better solution on how to provide quality data, but at the same time, ensure that the end user data is equally protected. So on the last one. So performance review, this is usually the final stage, which leads to issuance of the verified uh, carbon credits. So the VVB will pre provide the verification report to the standard with either the positive or negative opinion. And this will be reviewed. A uh, timely frame for this usually takes two months from the time of submission. And also depending on you know the issues that are raised, we have seen some projects going up to six months or more uh, to close on this. And then uh, 
once now the review is complete and the requisite fees is paid, it leads to basically a certified uh, gold standard project, meaning that these issues has been made and it can be available to the market uh, for trading. And uh, there are some projects that actually seek just not emission reductions, they, they go for specific benefits uh, like uh, energy certificates, we call them RECs. We have water benefits. So, but now for specific for carbon, uh, those ones are not tradable, but for the carbon emissions, actually, the carbon credits are tradable. So I think that's it in terms of the process. And my parting shot is basically that uh, for clean cooking uh, sector, basically there is need for carbon financing. And if the best that can be done is to support project developers, especially those who are coming in the market, to overcome these barriers that are restricting them to uh, provide to access carbon financing. There's a lot of uh, myths that you know uh, surround this sector, and basically that provides a framework for you know us and other people in the sector to create platforms like what TEP has done for information sharing and creating awareness and also presenting the opportunities that are available uh, the, uh, in the sector so that uh, we can all come together and develop very high quality carbon projects that can be of benefit to everyone. So thank you. Thank you so much, Lillian, for that very informative session. Sorry. Uh, I'll now invite Kari from MCFA. RBF bridges early stage support offered by challenge funds such as EP and debt financing as companies with scale. I'll now welcome you to talk us through MCFA's approach and the role you see the RBF playing in strengthening the ecosystem. Welcome, Kari. Am I unmuted now? Thank you. So uh, I'm Kari Hemekoski from NEFCO Nordic Environment Finance Corporation, and, and NEFCO is, is a green bank. We only deal with environmental climate projects. We we do nothing else. And actually, we are based in, in Helsinki, same same building at NDF, our sister organization. I'm very pleased to present uh, uh, the Monokuki Facility for Africa, which is one of our activities. Uh, we have a sister activity ongoing called the Grid Fund for Africa. Uh, and that's energy access program in also, also in Africa. So the, the main elements of, of this uh, modern cooking facility for Africa, it's basically it, it's cook, cooking services. We are we are not dealing with uh, with cook stoves as such. We are we are only dealing with cooking solutions. And we are only dealing uh, with the with the very high tier cooking solutions. So not improved cook stoves. We want to support innovative business models, pay go, stove use monitoring. So it's sort of in a way kind of piloting uh, piloting program. And of course, um uh, carbon finance is, is crucial element and, and uh NEFCO and myself have been working on, on carbon finance for 20, 20 years or so. So maybe the next slide, thank you. Yes, uh, MCFA was launched in November 21. Uh, initially, it was fully funded by Sweden, uh, 32 million euros. And two weeks ago, uh, the European Union joined the program for Zambian window uh, for 12.5 million euros. And in EFCO, we, we manage the program, but we actually, we will outsource quite a few services to um, uh, some other companies, and this this is ongoing this this process. And please visit our website. Next one, please. Yes, uh, idea is to to to, to really to accelerate the the modern cooking solutions. Uh, we are working in in several African countries, sub-Saharan countries, DRC, Kenya, Mozambique, Tanzania, Zambia, Zimbabwe. And we will be only dealing with with private companies. We call them cooking service providers. 
that can can provide these uh, high tier cooking services tier uh, four and five cook stoves combined with the fuel or uh, tier three with uh, gasifier stoves again associated with the sustainable fuel and we can accept uh, various fuels sustainable fuels electricity biogas bioethanol pellets briquettes solar thermal and of course we contribute to several sdgs affordable and clean energy and and as we know there are quite a few other benefits uh, gender climate biodiversity and so on and health and as we just heard, uh, the carbon finance plays a major role uh, in these, these projects. We, in our case, we are basically providing some support for the companies if needed for, for carbon finance. But also we want to make sure that we, we don't oversubsidize any, any companies that, that may not actually need any, any more public subsidy for, for cookstop projects. Actually, cookie solution projects, to be clear. Next one, please. Basically, um, in, in this case, typically NEFCO rarely works with grants as such. We, we basically, uh, we work with the, with the loans, investments and, and, and results-based financing typically. But here we can also offer 30% uh, kind of grant, catalytic grant that would help these companies because this, this business is not as developed as let's say solar business. So we have this, this uh, possible grant component up front. As mentioned, we definitely want to support the PAYGO uh, operations, also for stoves, stove use monitoring. And the key, as I mentioned, is, is integrated tool and fuel model. No, no, your uh, cook stoves as such are eligible for us. We started with the pre-qualification last year, around a year ago. So basically a simple, first stage that companies did not need to fill too much information in the first stage. And now we launched a second stage called final application in September last year. And now we are, we have shortlisted quite a few companies and now we are, we have entered in DD, DD phase and we hope to sign the first contract in a, in a rather near future. Uh, so the highest ranking companies are right now in the DD process at this very moment. We actually do have some funding available and, and the second call is planned to be launched later, later this year. And of course, definitely we will fine tune some, some rules and procedures, possibly make it possibly more simple this time and now, because we more or less know now what do we need from the companies. Uh, next slide. And here's some tentative numbers uh how many contracts what may be the average size of the contract of course this all will be negotiated in, in the next few months uh so hopefully we get from one to one to even six contracts per country we have more funding in zambia thanks to eu funding and let's see what happens after the possible second call And here is again kind of summary what is eligible. So it's it's to some extent kind of piloting because we are really aiming for high high tier solutions, and there are not so many companies offering yet these services. But of course, we sort of like to push the boundaries to really go for higher higher tier um, cook, cooking solutions and and to generate more benefits. Uh, and the last one, I'll be very quick here. So I want to know the team, uh, the last one, please. And especially my colleagues, Heli and, and Emma, they are in charge for the, for the facility. I'm, I'm personally managing a few, few projects and supporting the, the whole program and especially from carbon finance point of view. I'll stop here. I'm happy to, to answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kari, for that presentation. And I know a lot of the companies are looking forward to being beneficiaries of the MCFA RBF, and we're excited about this um, instrument as well. Yeah. So next on, I will invite Amarins, who is the Chief Data Officer for ACE, 
ACE is also one of EP Africa's portfolio companies, and ACE actually ties in a lot of the other presentations that have been made so far. ACE has been in operation for more than 10 years now and sold over 60,000 cook stores over that period and has also been successful at raising equity financing and also benefiting from carbon finance. So my first question to you, Amarins, is what role has grant funding played in the development of ACE? And while at that, kindly begin by introducing ACE and the work you do and yourself. And then you can answer the question on the role grant funding, especially EEP, has played in the development of ACE so far. Welcome. I think you're mute. Ah, yeah, perfect. Um, thank you for that introduction, Faith. Um, my name is Amelie Tarkam. I'm Chief Data Officer at African Clean Energy. So I'll start with a small introduction to the company. African Clean Energy, we produce um, these cook stoves and um, they, you can cook in them uh, and it results in when you turn on the fan and you can burn any uh, dry biomass in it, it will um, result in an optimal burning of whatever you are burning so it will result in a, in a sort of gasification which makes it optimal for cooking and reducing the smoke completely um, but it also comes with a solar panel so and a light so you can use these two usb ports to to charge uh, whatever device you have or create any lighting that you have now one of the things that makes it more unique is this latest model which we sold now around twenty thousand of with the help of uh, eep um, is that it has a um, electronic chip with a flash drive in it, which means that um, whenever our end users, our customers use this stove, we will start counting the seconds for every second that they use uh, electricity. That's one, one counter and another counter counts every second of cooking usage that they do which means that um, once we get that data, uh, we are able to very specifically see how much usage per customer was used um, and also really helps us with uh, calculating carbon offsets based off of that. So we don't use estimates, but we use real data. Um, and how EEP helped with, uh, with this is uh, we launched a project in uh, Lesotho. So we have uh, four main countries, Lesotho, Uganda, Kenya and Cambodia. And in Lesotho, we started this pilot project with combining this with a smartphone and seeing if people are actually, if, if, if it works, like can we actually retrieve that data? Uh, do customers um, use the smartphone, um, how is it going? And I think we we sold over 2,000 units uh, with smartphones from the top of my head. And um, it was really a great pilot project to start it off. And based on that, we were able to scale it out. And now we have received the data of over 10,000 stoves in all of our countries, um, resulting in 20,000 tons and 10,000 10, tons of CO2 we have actually already sold for 20 euros a ton. So um, yeah, that's a little bit in short how it, uh, how it has impacted ACE. Amazing. And so we had a short discussion previously about how the use of this technology has increased utilization of your cook stoves, but also really changed the culture and strengthened your business model on the ground from the different touch points of that you have with your customers. Could you tell us a little more about that? Yeah, of course. So of course the carbon revenue on the one hand is, is great for that extra revenue stream, which really will allow us to scale um, because cash flow based on grants is great and it really helps, but it is really even better if we can start getting independent um, and really get into the next phase of our company. So when we st two years ago, we created this vision where we want to move away from just numbers of sales that we're selling um, to maximizing the carbon offsets that we do. So the impact that we're actually achieving. So um, because we are able to measure uh, our carbon offset to such a detailed extent, we are now able to um, chase not sales targets, but carbon offset targets throughout the company, 
which means that when a sales team uh, sells the stove, it's not a one-off interaction. You're actually um, including this customer into our energy network, and we want to be able to make sure that this customer is a happy customer. They're using the product um, and that they are willing to come back and sync their data with us. Um, which means that um, once we started with the uh, with with the EEP project and and the phones, the average usage in the Sutu at the time was around 50 minutes of uh, cooking usage per day. But by changing this in a year, we already changed this to two hours of usage per day because customers are now understanding it more. They get that more of an extra explanation. Um, and our NPS score changed from 65 to 85 last year. Um, as well as our call center productivity, um, they do double the amount of calls because they really know like what they're trying to do. You, but they have a clear goal. We want happy customers that are using the product. Um, whereas maybe 10, uh, 10 happily using customers can produce more impact for us than maybe double the amount with unhappy customers. So um, this really changed uh, changed our mindsets, but also just um, really making sure that we put the customer at the center of everything that we do, which is good for the customer, but will also be good for the company in the end. Amazing. And final question to you. ACE is really taking the approach of leaving no one behind. So you are employing people who are, are disabled. You have a lot of women and a lot of gender mainstreaming in your company. And there's also an element of sharing the revenues with your customers could you tell us a bit more about that and how that has one enriched the culture of the organization but also given is an edge in the market yeah so uh, we have now for 475 employees and most of them are in the in the markets um, we have uh, our commission model is in such a way that um, our sales teams don't get commission just by the sale, but they only receive the commission once the customer's actually happily using it, once all the data that we have for that customer is correct, whether we can reach the customer, we have a GPS location from these customers, um, and the whole image is complete, then they receive a commission. Now, call center receives a commission whenever uh, the customer, uh, uh, we receive data from the customer, customers are happy as well, same for maintenance. Um, so that really helps uh, maximizing that impact and also making sure that the people in our country benefit as well from that carbon revenue coming in. However, our end user um, also will benefit from this carbon revenue and we already are doing that at the moment. So we have around um, 75 plus thousand stoves sold, which are 75,000 households. Now, 20,000 of those we can actually retrieve the data from. But whoever customer is a happy and using customer and syncs their data with us, we um, give them sustainable fuels. So even though you use dry, dry biomass in this, but if you're still using charcoal, it's great that you need only 30% of that charcoal that you would need otherwise on your traditional cooking stove. Um, we still want to reduce that 30% and replace that with, for example, a pellet or a briquette, um, which, it, which makes it even more sustainable. Now, um, we, what we do is we sell these below, far below cost price and give them to our customers um, for a price that's below the charcoal that they would normally buy, enabling them to move away from these polluting fuels. Um, so the responsibility of that additional price doesn't lie with the end user, but we are actually, but carbon buyers are actually able to offset and subsidize that for them, um, increasing and, and, and maximizing our skill further. Amazing. Thank you so much, Marines. Our next speaker, I will invite Colleen from uh, SNB. And we've spoken about the need for data, especially with new innovations in the ecosystem. We've also talked about leaving nobody behind. And electric pressure cookers are a new and upcoming uh, technology. You have been running a pilot in Kakuma with uh, Max on this. Uh, could you kindly share some of that data 
uh, what's exciting, what are the findings from that particular pilot and what we can learn as we usher in um, new innovations in the in the space. Welcome, Colleen. Yeah, thank you, Faith. Um, hi, everyone. So my name is Colleen Groen. I work as a project advisor for SNP Kenya on energy projects in a specific um, several market development projects based in Kakuma Refugee Camp. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so just to give you a background, um, so we know uh, which context we're talking about today. Um, so Kakuma Refugee Camp and also Colombia Integrated Settlement, which is usually referred to as one camp, um, but one is a camp and one is a settlement, um, is located in Turkana County, which is in northern Kenya. Um, it's been there for over 30 years and has now a current population of 250,000 people and 60,000, um, yeah, I would say Turkana people, local community, host community. Uh, and this number is growing um, because of the yeah, ongoing um, insecurities from the uh, countries of origin. Um, so that's the next slide, please. So um, as SNV, we have been implementing since 2017, the market-based energy access project, which is uh, funded under the Ener Energizing Development Program. And this um, project um, yeah, looks at providing market-based access through supporting the private sector, um, both solar and cooking companies um, to enter yeah, the camp and develop the distribution channels um, and yeah, and provide their products through the market to both households, micro businesses, and also social institutions. And we do this through technical assist uh, assistance, activity-based grant funding, and also awareness raising to uh, be able to change communication campaigns. Um, now, this has been more of the, the umbrella project. And now since recent years, we've also have a focus on introducing new technologies such as electric pressure cooker. Um, and so specifically, we have implemented one pilot um, um, of electric pressure cookers um, targeted mostly at mini grid customers in Colombia. And now recently we started piloting, as Faith mentioned, um, large electric pressure cookers within social institutions. And so I'll mo mostly be talking about um, yeah, our experiences so far with those two pilots um, and also yeah, kind of shed some light on what the private sector needs to um, yeah, further provide um, access to um, yeah, for people um, of these technologies. So next slide, please. So the pilot electric pressure cookers in Colombia project, that's the name, um, we tested the use of EPCs, I'll call them, um, with 100 refugee and host community households through a market-based approach. And so what we did is, um, yeah, basically we partnered with a private sector company um, who we um, yeah, trained on the product, um, provided them with the units, and then they sold them using different um, payment models. Um, we're also doing yeah, massive uh, marketing um, and end user training on the product. Um, at the same time, we collected data, and this was, uh, this was primarily led by class um, on both end user experience, but also um, we use smart meters um, to track the consumption of the APCs and compare this as well with the overall mini grid um, electricity consumption to really understand yeah, what can the impact of EPCs be on electricity consumption from mini grid, as this of course will also have positive benefits, um, outcomes um, for demand stimulation of mini grids. And then we also focused on knowledge dissemination. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so here are just some photos of what that looked like. Um, so you can see, yeah, someone buying um, an APC and we put it on the on the on the motorbike. Um, and then on the left side, you see what the trainings for both sales agents and you know, end users look like. Next slide, please. Um, so what we found from this specific pilot, um, as we as I said, we this we implemented this for a year. We um, we tested 20 units and we sold 80 units using the different payment models. And at the same time, we collected the data and also, um, yeah, continuously were in touch with the key stakeholders, stakeholders and partners. So collected their feedback on the experience as well. So what we found was um, the technology was really well received by the end users. Uh, and also um, our data shows that it has a positive impact or potential to have a positive impact um, um, through reduced cooking time as compared to cooking with either um, sharp charcoal or firewood. Um, mostly also the time savings, 
were actually one of the uh, primary benefits mentioned, even over fuel savings. Um, and also what it was a very, I would say, surprising benefit was a reduced water consumption um, from the switch of cooking um, on firewood or charcoal through cooking with an EPC. And as you can imagine, um, water is quite a scarce good in this surrounding. And so that is really um, a big benefit. Um, other, I would say, key learnings. Um, yeah, we found with in terms of the payment models. Um, so the um, APC, they, it went for about $80, so that is um, quite high. Um, there was not necessarily a subsidy. And so what we, what we did, we designed different payment models um, with 20 week payment to up to four week payments. And so the depo and then people had to pay a deposit and then pay, pay back a weekly installment based on the um, payment plan they were on. Uh, what we found is that initially people paid um, and then people, yeah, kind of reduced payments and most of the customer actually defaulted. Now we have, we see kind of a mix of um, explanations uh, for this scenario. So first of all, the private sector partner we work with, for them, they were usually a distributor of solar products and they were not so much, well, they didn't have any experience of managing a credit um, model. And so in that sense, it was kind of underestimated how, you know, it's a completely different ball game um, to do customer vetting, um, to yeah, ha handle the payment recollection processes and systems. And so that was one. And then they were also quite focused on, you know, getting the sales out, um, which kind of take away from, you know, the focus on recollecting the payments. And at the same time, we, of course, we also um, need to be cognizant of the fact that we operate in a low income environment People have very fluctuating incomes, especially within this refugee setting. Um, I do want to uh, point out though, that within this setting, people have very different income levels. So there's people that are complete, com completely reliant on um, humanitarian aid. And there are people that um, yeah, either receive remittances, have their own business, or are um, working for the humanitarian agencies. So also there, there's, there's no one size fits all. But yeah, this definitely shed light on, you know, the complexities of running a payroll system within for a new product like this um, in such a setting. And so what we really see in terms of scale up, um, although, you know, the, from an end user perspective, the technology was in that sense really well received um, to really build a sustainable supply chain. Um, yeah, we really just look into how can we capacitate the private sector to do, to do so and come up with an inclusive business model um, and also really focus on after sales as, um, yeah, this is also quite key. Um, yeah. And then lastly, what we also found is that um, APC's uptake among mini grid customers um, has the potential to increase mini grid electricity con consumption, but of course does require um, consistent supply of energy. And so maybe to give you a bit more of a background. So there is in Colombia integrated settlements, um, a 500 and 40 kilowatt peak um, um, hybrid um, solar mini grid system connecting about 2,500 um, yeah, end users, both households and small businesses and institutions. And so this was the, also the primary focus on who we um, targeted within this pilot. Uh, and so it was very interesting to see how indeed there was a wide interest and uptake, um, but among the end users, the use, the, 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 um, the use did change. Um, from person to person in terms of how, how often they use the EPC. So there's also quite a big um, need for, condition, for additional end user training to ensure sustained and frequent usage. And I think this is similar to the exper experiences that uh, Amarin shared. Next slide. Yeah, so then maybe the last pilot I just want to um, talk, tell you about. Um, unfortunately, this is still ongoing, so we don't have the, you know, the concrete uh, out final outcomes yet. Um, but just to, to, to let you know, so currently what happens in, in Hakuma Refugee Camp and Colombia Integrated Settlement is that UNHCR provides um, viable to social institutions every month. And these are about 50 institutions, so schools, hospitals, reception centers. And this goes to 100 metric tons of firewood every month. So you can imagine the quantities and the costs. Um, a lot of the stoves that people cook with in these um, institutions. So these are really big stoves with um, 100 to 300 liter uh, pot sizes um, are often in need for repair or of insufficient capacity to actually do all the cooking they need to do. Now UNHCR has very recently solarized most of the institutions 
And so this formed the basis for our pilot, which actually looks at testing um, large electric pressure cookers. So these are 20 to 40 liter um, to understand what is the feasibility of this technology um, for institutions. Um, so this is um, a project we're doing together with the Modern Energy Cooking Services Program, who are supporting the research uh, part of this. And so, yeah, what we're really in looking into, to what extent can EPC, um, can large EPC substitute biowood cooking, or at least partially, and then what are the co costs associated with this? And then, yeah, to reach scale, what is necessary so to provide wide access to these institutions, what is necessary there? Um, and then, you know, once we have the data, hopefully we can also explore, okay, then how can we realize and drive this scale um, using the different, um, yeah, finance um, options available within the broader clean cooking or impact, impact investing landscape, which I think a few examples have been mentioned here, for instance, carbon finance um, or RBF. So I'll leave it there for now. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Caroline. That is quite enlightening, and especially as we think about the market having very early stage innovations or business models, and just great to see so much packed in the work that you're doing in uh, Kakuma. We'll now, first I would like to thank all our presenters. Amazing job, thank you so much. We have a few questions that are coming for you. We have 10 minutes and about seven questions, so we should have ample time to address them. Past questions will go to Ronan. Uh, two questions for you. First, uh, thanks to Ronan for a brilliant presentation. My question is why are others in the value chain, e.g. distributors, deprived of core benefits, I believe of, uh, of, of mainly carbon financing in the, in the value chain? I think it's just a question around the customers, like how do, how do you make decisions around who owns the carbon uh, rights? Yeah, it's, it's a really good question and um, certainly something that, again, to plug the working groups is, is going to be a, a key area of discussion and debate uh, in those groups. Um, some research that was not done by CCA, I'll, I'll send it to you, Faith, in the, to, to include in the meeting notes, but it, it showed the kind of ranges of how carbon credit value is, is split along the value chain. Um, and the interesting thing, I think, is that it's you know, um, between... 10 and 40% uh, is the value that gets actually given to the end customer, um, which is low considering that they're the ones that are generating the credits, right? Um, so maybe I'll just, I'll stop there and say it, it, it's, it's, it's an issue, there's conversations ongoing about what is equitable and fair about um, sharing carbon value along that value chain and for it to be more weighted towards those that are actually generating the, the credits. All right, thank you. So the next question is on the working groups, actually. And the question is, how can someone register or enlist for the working group? And is this for individuals or companies or both? Uh, it's for both. So we're uh, not <clears throat> um, putting any any filters or restrictions on those that um, that, that, that can join. Uh, I Again, I'll, I'll share a link to that, uh, Faith, and uh, people can, can click through. Uh, but it's, 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 it's on our website. Okay, perfect. We will share that as we share the presentation uh, with all the attendees. Our next question goes to Kari. So great having Kari on board. I noticed that Nigeria being the most populated country in Africa is being bypassed. How soon can the world meet SDG 7 with uh, leaving behind countries in West Africa? Uh, any plans to expand to West Africa? What is that dependent on? Uh Thank you very much. Very valid question. But I mean, the answer is simple. I mean, this is um, based on the donors' preference. And of course, uh, since the donors would like to expand, we I think we could, could easily do that. I mean, we have the machinery in place, It basically depending on, on, on funding. Thank you. Okay. And just another comment for Kari. Good to know MCFA is considering stove technologies alongside fuels. That is the best sustainable way to go. Thank you. <laughs> then there is a question here, and I'll, yes, first question for Kalin. Kalin, what is the size of the standalone systems you are trailing at the schools and clinic? I believe that should, could be the solar or both the solar and the EPC. Kalin, is the question clear? Yeah. 
I'm assuming it's the solar system they're referring to. Um, yeah, so those are, um, they range from 25 to 50 um, KWP. So yeah, we also had to really size, and I think that's that's a, yeah, a good question in terms of we really had to size, um, um, yeah, we had to look of course at the low profile of the system, to what extent can we introduce these EPCs and how many. Um, and so, yeah, you kind of restrict it to, of course, the system, but I think, um, yeah, I think that's why this pilot is quite important. We get the data, you know, to what extent can, you know, unfortunately, to see how much can it cook, to what extent, how many students, like school children, can it make meals for, and then it can also maybe form a basis to, yeah, add the, uh, expand the capacity of the, of the system. But at the moment, yeah, we're testing the 25 and 15 KWP size systems. Okay, awesome. Another question and comment here. I will ask this person to provide more information or just reach out after. Any plans for scaling EPCs? We are installing mini grids and would like to explore potential synergies with EPC. I'm assuming this is in Kakuma, but uh, any plans for scaling any more room? Are you scaling outside of what next after this particular pilot? The rest of the country, East Africa? Uh, ideally, um, yes. <laughs> No, I think, um, yeah, we're just uh, now wrapping up these, uh, well, the first pilot I mentioned. Um, so we'll be hopefully publishing the report soon. And I think this will also form a basis to see, um, yeah, what with these learnings, um, at least, you know, having some confirmation about from the end user perspective, yeah, this has great potential. Um, and also looking at the electrification rates um, within at least Kenya and I think also for sub Saharan Africa and the upcoming rise of mini grids, I think really the EPC has really great potential to, yeah, kind of, um, you know, have the cooking and the, and the electrification agenda together and, um, yeah, provide people with, yeah, a, a really the, the cleanest source of fuel possible. Um, and so I think, yeah, for now, for us, key is now, um, yeah, kind of bringing all the findings together, both for institutional cooking and household cooking and definitely also connecting that with the potential for demand stimulation and expansion or, you know, new, new mini grid development. Um, so no, nothing concrete at the moment, but that's something, one of the things we're doing with, with this experience and this data that we're going to explore now, what's the next step? Thanks. All right, amazing. And yeah, please reach out as well. Um, I'll, I'll put my email in the chat for more information. Thank you, Caroline. And just to shine a light on another one of our portfolio companies that is doing EPCs, they're calling, they're called Empowering Villages in Rwanda. And one of the things that they're piloting that I found quite interesting is actually cooking tariffs, tariff rates. So you have your usual tariff for other mini grid users, but especially because people cook at the same time or in the evening when there's very high demand, just coming up with tariff rates that just incentivize them to actually Keep cooking with EPC, but also increase the uptake. So possibly something we see happening in the space as you look at both the mini grid, but also more utilities. I know Umeme is interested in, in Uganda in uh, EPCs. Kenya has conversations as well around tariff rates to just incentivize more customers to uh, use EPC. So amazing to see that space um, picking up and more data and more pilot and testing going on. And then a question for Amarins is just on the cost of your cook stoves, how much do you sell them in, in Kenya and Uganda? I know you're operating in both. Um, I think we just changed the price, but it's uh, it's around 100 to 105 euros. Uh, and I can check, maybe it's a bit less in Uganda. I don't know from the top of my heart, but it, we do sell it with a based on a microfinance loan. Um, and we... Um, we are looking at once more carbon revenue comes in and we actually start like really get get that ball rolling um, further to reduce that, those costs. But we're also already a lot more lenient whether like sometimes people can't can't pay the, that sum back. But if they are happily using customers, then we are um, we are a lot less strict with like collecting those payments. Um, whereas someone who might be unhappy with the stove. We uh, repossess the stove, and sometimes um, we actually um, give the money back to them to be able to give it to a customer who's actually happily using the stove. So we're very much looking at 
making the most out of the entire system of, of all the stoves that we have. Thank you. Right on the minute, it is 4.30 p.m. Thank you so much for an amazing session. Thank you for all our attendees and okay. all our panelists. Have a good evening, and that is a, that is it for us from EP on Knowledge Week. See you again next year, and look out for our call for proposals in about a month. Hope to see very innovative applications coming in. Thank you. Bye Thank from you so Thank you. Bye bye. Okay. Thank you.